International Policy Code, a weekly program hosted by Les Vermazari. In Tunisia, the leader of Nida Tunis Party, Beji Kaid Sibsi, has announced his victory over the outgoing president, Mansef Marzouki, that is four years after the Arab Spring that ousted Zin Abidin Ben Ali from power. Sigma Media study firm in Tunisia gave Sibsi 55.5% of the vote, and his opponent, Mansef Marzouki, interim president, with 44.5%. The Independent High Authority for Elections, the independent public body that administers the elections, are to announce the official results later today. Tunisians placed hopes on their ability to create a new model of change on the national dialogue launched by political leaders, trade unions and civil society organizations to take the democratic transition out of the crisis into which it was driven by the assassinations of the two political leaders to leftist members of parliament, mainly Shukri Belaid and Mohammed Brahimi. Our guest this week is Ahmad Masdoua, London-based political analyst specialized in the Middle East, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. He previously worked as a political risk analyst for a global risk management company. Ahmad, welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. Tunisians have waited for the right to vote in free elections for decades. They have paid for during the Jasmine revolutions, haven't they? Well, yes, it's a historic moment for Tunisia um, and indeed for the whole Arab world and the Maghreb in particular. Um, this vote is uh, highly symbolic. It comes at the end of a very complicated and complex transition. Um, it will no doubt serve as an example for Tunisians in future generations also. It will set a precedent which is extremely important. Um, of course, um, votes in themselves are not an end in themselves. They are a method through which one can consolidate uh, democratic institutions and democratic processes. And this is what the Tunisians are doing. And I think by doing it in a calm, nonviolent, Uh, way through uh, dialogue and compromise as they showed during the negotiations for the constitution. They're giving an example to not only the Arab world, but I would say to, to, to the whole world. So uh, this is definitely a very important symbolic victory. On October 23, 2011, legislative elections were held to determine the composition of the 217-member Constituent Assembly. The Nahda party emerges as the winner, securing 90 seats with more than 40% of the vote. What were the main reasons behind Anahda's victory in the 2011 legislative elections? Well, obviously, um, the victory that Anahda secured in the early days after the revolution uh, was tied to a need for change. Uh, there's no doubt mm -hmm. that Anahda had been historically the most prominent opposition party to uh, the former uh, president, Zin Abdin Ben Ali. And mm -hmm. so that symbolic status that it had mm -hmm. as the most staunch opposition party to the former regime gave it an aura of change, an aura of credibility. And in a country that was yearning for something different, they were at the time the most credible uh, party to take over. Uh, as you know, however, their standing within the Tunisian political realm has changed greatly since then. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, um, it was the figure of Rashid al uh, those of his lieutenants who were seen as uh, political opponents. They'd been exiled. They had suffered a lot of persecution and repression under the former regime. So all of this history gave the party a lot of credibility. It's also worth noting that from an organizational point of view, Mm -hmm. in comparison to other parties which were just forming themselves in the aftermath of the revolution. And Nahda already came with very solid structures and institutions and a very strong PR machine. So mm -hmm. they, they were already very well organized, and that helped them win in the early days after the revolution. Well, well the 2011 was the first legislative elections held after the, uh, the revolution. Was it a step forward to democracy? It was the first step. It was important to, to, to really show uh, the world uh, other Arab Spring states did, but I think Tunisia was the best example. It was important to show that these elections could be held uh, peacefully, democratically, that new actors could emerge. And I think that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. But democracy is not simply a question of ballot boxes, isn't it? 
No, of course not. And this is what I was saying uh, mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, it's about several things. I think the first thing is the, really the construction and the solidification of institutions, uh, mm -hmm. real democratic institutions that are representative of the people, the will of the majority. But there's also a respect for the opinions and the choices of the minority. Mm -hmm. That's the second point. And then thirdly, there's accountability. Mm -hmm. And that means one election is not an end in itself. One election brings into power a political party which has to govern mm -hmm. with other political parties through coalitions, through compromise, through consensus, and then respect the choices of minorities, govern on behalf of all Tunisians. And in the aftermath, uh, this is what was done certainly during the Constitution, which I think represents the whole rainbow of ideologies that are present in Tunisian societies. Uh, it's certainly not a perfect constitution, but it's one that represented a historic compromise. And then lastly, the accountability is when a party governs for a certain amount of time, when it fails or succeeds, elections that come afterwards decide or uh, reflect people's opinions on the governing that's been done. And I think that's extremely important. And this is why Anahda, for example, uh, mm -hmm. served in power in the aftermath of, of the revolution and is mm -hmm. no longer in power now because this is, this is a perfect example of accountability. People were not happy with economic choices, so they decided to move on. So mm -hmm. I think your point is entirely correct. Mm -hmm. Then Marsif Marzouki, uh, the human rights activist and opposition leader under Bernali uh, regime, was elected president of Tunisia by the Constituent Assembly on the 12th of December 2011 to lead the transition period. Well, my question, uh, Ahmad, did Marsif Marzouki assure a successful transition? Did he succeed? Well, he certainly has made that point throughout his campaign in the presidential elections. I think history uh, will no doubt be the best judge uh, whether or not his transition was successful. I think from, a, you know, from an analytical point of view, mm -hmm. uh, there have been some successes that one could credit to his role. Certainly, uh, he played an important role in trying to create a dialogue with the Islam, between the Islamists and members of the former regime, or what some people in the international media like to call, you know, the secularists. Mm -hmm. um, he created this compromise and this avenue for dialogue, particularly in the moment of the Constitution, you know, the Troika and, and all these negotiations which took place in the transition. Now, some people say it wasn't his responsibility, but certainly under his presidency, a lot of compromises were made between different political actions, and that stopped Tunisia from going the road of the Egyptian scenario, which is, you know, a full return of the army, a return of... Uh, the ancien regime. So mm -hmm. I think whether or not it's his responsibility or the overall responsibility of the whole political class is, is up for debate. But he will, you know, Marzouki certainly pointed out during the trans during this election, the presidential election, that um, it was as a result of his efforts uh, that a compromise was was reached. Mm -hmm. Well, did the conflict in neighboring uh, Libya slow Tunisian growth at that time, that period? Yeah, um, you know, the conflict in Libya was important for all countries that are now facing the dilemma of the Arab Spring and that were facing the threat of popular uprisings. It's mm -hmm. to say, you know, is the chaos that Libya is witnessing, um, is it a model that can be exported elsewhere uh, in a dangerous way? And so uh, the same thing as, as what happened in Egypt, these, these failed mm -hmm. scenarios I think were a powerful um, deterrent for people advocating chaos or people advocating conflict in transition countries like Tunisia. So I think that the Libyan example and the Egyptian example were a powerful deterrent inside Tunisia's political class when they were debating very important issues relating to the transition to put aside some of their difference, mm -hmm. to try to come with some kind of reasonable compromises. And I think that was done. Mm -hmm. Well, the tasks of uh, that transitional government uh, were to organize the country's next election and to reduce the population's economic and uh, uh, security concerns. Did an leaders fear forceful removal from power when they agreed to enter into a national dialogue? Yes, I think there was that element of fear because, as I said, the Egyptian scenario was, you know, a very telling one, uh, a very threatening one. Mm 
Um, but, you know, the circumstances in Tunisia are obviously very different to Tunisia. I mean, the main thing I would say is that, um, for one, Tunisia does not have a, a, what we would call a politicized army. Mm -hmm. It's a professional army that has historically stayed out of politics and is likely to continue doing so. So it did not really have to worry about a forceful removal of power. But what it did worry about was accountability. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, a lot of the decisions that Ahmad was taking uh, could have affected it negatively in the long run. And I think a lot of Ahmad's leadership now is seeing much of the decisions they're taking or the decisions they took at the time um, in the broader framework of things. So we might not govern now, we might enter a national dialogue, we might make some compromises, but in the long run, we would like to be in a position where we solidify our movement's uh, implement, you know, implementation in uh, Tunisian politics. So I think there was an element of fear, but I think there was also a concern for the country's stability, and as I said just now, a real uh, wish to put a Nahada uh, at the heart of Tunisian politics in the longer term by making those compromises, by making the to show the world that Anahda is capable, as a, even as an Islamist party, to make compromise, to dialogue, etc. So it's giving itself more credibility in the long run. That was, I think, the objective. Anahda has kept a low profile then. No, I wouldn't say it's kept, well, it, I wouldn't say it's kept a low profile. What I would say is Anahda mm -hmm. has... Had a long strategy made, then, had a long-term strategy. Yes, I think Anahda is really in it for the long term, mm -hmm. uh, and it's seeing it's seeing some of the compromises it's making, some of the important political compromises that it's making, mm -hmm. as part of a broader strategy to give the group more credibility, both domestically and internationally. It's also a means of reshaping the movement's image mm -hmm. um, in light of everything that's going on in the region. I think the leadership of Anahda saw that as the, the right moment to shift the perception that the group had. Um, now, in, some would argue that from an electoral point of view, there were mistakes that were made, particularly in the recent mm -hmm. elections. Mm -hmm. uh, so too much compromise. But I think most analysts would agree that, that the decisions are made not for short-term gain, but for long-term gain mm -hmm. uh, inside Tunisian politics. Mm. Ahmed, what is causing rifts between political, religious, and social factions in uh, Tunisia? Well, it's, I think one thing that Tunisia is witnessing, uh, like many other Arab states at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, Muslim states in, in, a, in a broader sense, is this type of polarization in society between uh, what we call the classic secular left and, uh, you know, to put it in media terms, you know, political Islam. So, and political Islam is also a very heterogeneous concept. You know, you have you have your radicals, you have your moderates, you have your. But I think Tunisian society, like other societies, is witnessing that polarization. We've noticed that in the speeches of politicians. We see that in the speeches and the discussions and the debates on television, in the press, and in, in you know civil society. But the difference with Tunisia is that this dialogue and these rifts have not materialized into conflict, and that is what's most important. There is a polarization, but it has yet to display itself or manifest itself in any concrete violence between different factions. And that is what democracy is all about, and this is how Tunisia is setting about an example, an unprecedented one in our part of the world. Um, so polarization there is. There's also polarization which is perhaps even more important than that one, which is one which is based on economics. Um, I think that the, that debate or that that term of analysis is not usually used a lot, but you know there is there are economic disparities in Tunisia, north versus south, rural versus urban. These are the kinds of real rifts that exist that are not necessarily discussed, which sometimes actually mirror the societal debates we're talking about. You know, rural versus urban can sometimes be secular versus religious. So there are disparities, but mm -hmm. the great thing about Tunisia is that they haven't manifested themselves in any kind of violence. Mm. Tunisia's parliamentary elections held on October 26th resulted in Nida Tunis garnering the largest share. Was there a strategy behind their victory or it was just due to swing voters 
who were responsive to government performance. I think you're entirely right about the government performance. There, mm-hmm. most uh, most people framed it as a rejection in Western media. Certainly, the the, dial- the the analysis that was presented was that people voted based on you know these ideological polarized polarized lines of secular versus Islamist. But really, I think most astute observers noted that it was because of government performance. Uh, people, for the most part, the swing voters that you mentioned, mm-hmm. um, voted based on experience in handling economic affairs, and Nida Tunis had that perception within some elements of Tunisian society. Um, and, you know, a rejection of the inability that Anahda had had to restore economic growth Mm-hmm. Um, the inability to provide the kind of public services that people were expecting. So all of these economic delivery or economic performance of the government, these, this performance reflected negatively on an mm-hmm. And so people, were swing voters, uh, turned to Nida. Well, during the second round of presidential elections, only 95% of Tunisia's 5.3 million voters cast their balance. Why such a low turnout? Well, I think there's an element of fatigue, mostly. I attribute it to, uh, you know, electoral fatigue. I think it's worth noting that Tunisia... There's a decline in optimism among Tunisian youth and uh, former revolutionaries. Yes, um, there is a form of, as I said, fatigue, Mm -hmm. because um, people feel disappointed that maybe some of the key aspects that were at the heart of the revolution have yet to be addressed. Um, we have all these debates, but as I said, it all comes back down to socioeconomic development. This was one of the key things which was at the heart of uh, the revolution, you know, dignity, economic dignity, prosperity, employment for young people. Mm-hmm. So there has been discouragement, there has been fatigue, and as a result, people are turning out less to vote. Um, Mm. I think there is a disenchantment, but um, that disenchantment is likely to change as elections, you know, continue to be held in the country and as change is, you know, change is going to be incremental. And so people will no doubt return to voting once they see a progressive return to stability, uh, certainly on the economic front. Ahmed, do you expect Beji Qaid Sibsi lead a democratic government? Well, it's going to have to be a democratic uh, government because so far uh, most observers have said that the election was free and fair. Mm -hmm. So any government that he decides to pick will be a government, uh, a government which is democratic. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, there are accusations that are being placed against him that and and his and his party that you know a return, a, a victory for. Uh, Beji Qaid the Sibsi is a victory for the ancien regime, former regime, because many people... The return people... of one party rule, you mean? No, a, a return of elements who once worked in... Zin Abedin Ben Ali. In the Zin Abedin Ben Ali administration. Mm-hmm. People who are what they call RCDist, people from the former uh, one party. One party. Um, now, unfort- I mean, unfortunately for them, mm-hmm. the... Those analysts who are saying uh, that it will be returned to one-party rule, uh, I think that's, for now, highly unlikely because Anahda hasn't disappeared completely and neither have other parties uh, from the opposition. Mm-hmm. They are still important players in the political landscape. Mm-hmm. And any government that Bajikai de Sibsi puts into place will have to uh, govern through coalition. Uh, it's worth noting that if he does win, which which is highly likely, he's done it not only through his the votes of his supporters, mm-hmm. but also through the vote of other uh, political parties, which rallied around him in the in the aftermath of the first round. So, people like uh, Hamba Hamiami and and others. So he will have to govern in a coalition. People from um, FF Tunis as well. Mm-hmm. So all of these parties will have to govern in a coalition and therefore um, in a democratic framework, if that makes sense. Amal, what's at stake for Tunisia's president? A lot. Uh, Frankly, uh, a lot is at stake. What are the challenges? Uh, Well, the main challenges, uh, I would say, are on the socioeconomic front. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Higher growth, uh, 
a better repartition of wealth, more opportunities for those who are marginalized in Tunisian society, particularly the youth, giving them more opportunities. Youth unemployment is high as it is in other parts of our region, so addressing that is is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Delivering on government services is also extremely important. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Tunisia does not live in a vacuum. Uh, there is...